Uh, kia ora everyone. Um, it's an absolute privilege to be presenting to you all. Um, all of you in your various places have in your own ways contributed to this work about the emotional responses that Pākehā have as we learn more about our treaty relationships. So it's a privilege to be here face to face with some of you. Some of you I haven't, I've read but not seen. And it's also amazing to be here with a music student, kia ora, and someone from the US. So kia ora to you as well. Um, so my um, background is um, I'm the first generation child of Dutch immigrants. So I grew up speaking my own language. And um, my colleagues sometimes say I do have quite a um, clear view of British colonialism at times because of that non-British upbringing. Um, nevertheless, I have you know all the Pākehā privilege that comes with growing up here. And so I have spent my life doing um, yeah, treaty education work, anti-racism work, and so on. So um, that culminated in the end in a PhD in the early 2000s of going around the whole treaty education movement and asking those um, elders and teenager generation, which was mine, um, how we theorised Pākehā change. And to my incredible surprise, I did not expect this, um, the theorising of emotion was probably stronger or as strong as the theorising about new learning and new information about history. So that's where this um, presentation comes from. Is um, I wrote it all into the PhD, but then I didn't know what else to do with it because there actually was not a lot of theorising around emotion, um, especially not in the areas of critical discursive theory and um, work. Um, or even actually that much in decolonization work. So today I want to lead you through briefly into some of the other areas that I found helpful, and then we'll um, dovetail back into the local work and also an amazing contribution that one of our own um, Kiwi social psychologists, Margaret Weatherall, has made recently by um, giving us a, a book. I'll just hold it up for everyone. Can you see this book? <laughs> called Affect and Emotions in the Social Scientists, in the Social Sciences. So it's um, helping us have um, stronger methodologies for working with emotion. And that's kind of the end point of my um, presentation will be encouraging all of us, no matter what our work is, I'm not so much sure about population studies here, but no matter what our work is, to be courageous about involving emotion in our data and in our analyses. Because, um, you know, all our critical decolonization work, it isn't just about discourse. It is actually also about emotion and relationships. So, hopefully, are all of you getting this without an echo? Yeah, that seems to be our one that's creating the echo. So when you speak, I'll have to turn ours off. But um, I'll go for maybe 20, 20 minutes from here. And then we'll open it up to discussion. And, you know, I very much encourage all of us to be thinking about, you know, think about your own work and how you can be building emotion into the data you gather and the analysis you do. So the imagery you can see here comes from those treaty educators who were theorizing about emotion. So um, there's some sprinkling of hearts through all this. Um, but you'll also, we'll also turn in the second half of the talk into to Maori theorizing about you know reconciliation, restorative practice, and intergroup forgiveness. So um, it's beautiful to put the two things alongside each other, actually. <clears throat> and then that last point there, that's your turn, all of you, because I don't actually do that much theorizing about identity. I guess because I'm solid in my Dutch identity, um, but there is so much work to be done in the whole, all the issues about Pākehā and other tauiwi, you know, for identity, belonging, and but of remembering too. So it, it was encouraging in the early part of last century, um, you know, people like Jung and Freud were busy happily theorising about emotion and um, 
you know, this is just a little um, indicator to all of you to reach back if you want to look for um, encouraging methodological work about emotion. So, you know, Jung's giving us plenty of encouragement there about the cognitive, transformational, motivational aspects of emotion. But to be honest, the social sciences and psychology largely neglected emotion, or largely avoided it actually, um, as the 20th century went on, because of all the reasons to do with rationalist um, um, science. But I looked beyond um, psychology and the social sciences, and this theorist here is an educational theorist, and in fact it's in learning theory that you do find more about emotions. So emotions actually function as ways of evaluating morally and ethically the new information that we are given at any time in our lives about anything, um, which is a really interesting idea that we have emotional responses to information or to discourses that help us evaluate them. And that that's both a source of movement, but also a source of resistance as you can see there. Um, so here we have Margaret Wetherill, as I said, just much more recently, she's done a huge review of, the, so of yeah, all um, good methodologies about emotional work. And she's, you know, strongly encouraging us all that emotional and effective practice is woven into all discursive practice. So emotions are innately bound up with meaning making and we shouldn't be neglecting them. So you can see them in fact as effective meaning making practices. And then a last bit of um, theory again, going back to the area of um, transformational learning. Um, this is Mezzi Rowe and his associates um, back in the 90s, he's still writing, where he says, um, when our new experiences are inconsistent with what we expect, and we now know a huge amount about what we expect, you know, dominant discourses set up, um, construct our worlds. It can actually result in a feelings of meaninglessness and that in itself creates anxiety. Now that's really interesting. That means we might resist new information to actually avoid the emotional distress and discomfort of meaninglessness. So for all of us, even if we deal mostly in discourses and identity and so on, we still need to be aware when we're analyzing, is somebody resisting new information? And then, you know, they're using a kind of a predictive evaluation to avoid information that would create meaninglessness. So that's Mezzi Rose um, <coughs> saying there. And um, yeah, so to go back to Margaret, I mean, Margaret says that emotions are crucial partners in our effective discursive practices. And they do, they're part of what weaves together to construct social formations, so relationships, political relationships, personal histories and embodied subjectivities. So they're important in all of the above. Right, so let's look at where, what I found in the end as being the most useful um, yeah, methodologies for looking at emotions in the work I was doing, which was about people's responses to learning about the treaty, because I do, I'm a treaty educator all around the country, that's what I do. So, um, you know, hence my interest in the, the place of emotions and the responding that people do to learning about the treaty and colonization. And what I found the most useful was something that Gergen, a social psychologist back in the 90s came up with, where he did some really um, interesting exploratory work about emotions as features of relationships rather than as features of individuals. So, you know, our, our kind of classic view is that emotions are these internal events that go on inside individuals. I mean, it's a very psycho psychology view anyway. Um, but there he is, a social psychologist saying, look, emotions are features of relationships rather than individuals. They're internal events, not in the individual, they're internal events in the relationship. And, you know, we're quite sophisticated in what we now know of as what goes on internally and what we project. So that's where Margaret's phrase, the effective practice is useful. We don't always have to, um, you know, um, kind of imply or assume what the person's emotion is, but we can be reading effective practice, reading what they project. And those effective practices within relationships um, 
become intelligible through cultural interpretations. I'll come back to that in a minute. Let's just go to the third point about trust and betrayal. So relationships have structures that are about real um, resources in the real world, real histories that have happened. And it's within those structures that there's either been trust that has been built or betrayal of trust. And emotions are experienced within those historical structures of relationships. And it's, a, um, it's an interaction. Um, for instance, those same theorists down the bottom, Weber and Carter, who I think I'm right in saying they're feminist sociologists, they say that relationships are actually constituted through spirals of emotion with each person responding to the previous emotion of the other, which is beautiful. I mean, and that goes on between cultural groups as well, and we'll get into that in a minute. But it is a whole different way of thinking about emotions and how we can read them in interactions. And that when we see text or discourse or interviews or media or, you know, anything that we're working with, probably music as well, um, you know, we can actually theorize what's going on between the parties in a relationship. And it's what they're doing is trading emotions, you know, back and forth. So that's quite wonderful. Relationships can be seen as constituted through spirals of emotion, each responding to the previous emotion of the other. Now, going back to that middle point, these effective practices are read, you know, they're intelligible by the parties involved through cultural interpretations. And that's again where all our um, discursive work comes in. And those cultural interpretations, and I have to thank Margaret for this, she's um, sent us in the direction of some amazing theorists who talk about the fact that in different times of history, there have been different emotional regimes at play. And the classic one, of course, is the Victorian regime, where, you know, and we all, we've all been watching Downton Abbey and other, you know, Pride and Prejudice, where it was not appropriate in the British world of that time to display much emotion at all. Um, there were very um, clear limits on what emotions were displayed. And, you know, we, we kind of caricature that, but actually that's going on in every historical period of history. There are emotions that are intelligible and acceptable, and there are others that are not. So you could say there's always limits, um, but people like Reddy say that some emotional regimes in history are healthier than others and allow for more um, yeah, working through of grievances or historical um, traumas that have happened. And that makes complete sense. So let's turn to, so what does, what does our New Zealand colonial regime actually look like then? How does it stack up? Now, Nandy, the, another theorist that... Um, actually an Irish psychologist directed me to. He's an Indian decolonization theorist and maybe a bit like me, he's quite happy to criticize British colonialism. And he says, look, British colonialism because, or any colonialism actually, because the people who become the colonists are forced in a way to be witnesses of terrible violence. And that that is emotionally traumatizing for the colonizer as well. And that what then happens is that the colonizer has to create an emotional regime that limits the repertoire of emotions. In fact, they have to kind of stunt their own emotional repertoire to be able to bear it, to be able to stand it. Sadly, though, that sets up a whole um, cultural you know, repertoire of emotions that's very limited. And Nandi criticizes British colonialism, saying what it did was set up um, an emotional repertoire of aggressive masculinity, of manly emotions, um, that really avoided vulnerability and absolutely avoided looking deeply within the person. Now, he was, I mean, the British colonialism was busy happening at the same time as things like rationalist science were happening. So at the same time, there was the... Um, the setting aside of myth and of intuition and of things that were unknowable and mysterious. So, you know, there was, there was a whole lot of other things going on as well intellectually, but that's what happened to the emotional regime um, under British colonialism. And the, a very um, scary thing that Nandy says, he says, it happened to the colonists and then it flowed backwards into British society and affected the way the middle class acted. And a lot of the playwrights, I mean, you think of um, 
what is it, George Orwell and um, sorry, writers, but also um, Bernard Shaw and others wrote about these things and they um, sat satirized the stiff emotional um, middle class British emotional regime. But the scary thing that Nandy says is that it flowed backwards into British society, and I don't I entirely know where he got the date from, in 1830. And then you think, well, when was New Zealand colonized? It was colonized just after that. So, you know, we, we, are, we do have this as a legacy. That's basically what I took from Nandy. We do have this as a legacy. So we need, let's look at whether it does seem to show through in our local work. And certainly if we look at all the work that's been done on media in New Zealand by, you know, you, you recognize those um, writers there, um, Helen and Angela Mwewaka Barnes, um, Tim McCrenna, Ray Nairn and so on. Absolutely, um, you know, we silence discourses from Māori, but also from activist Pākehā that would require an emotional response. You know, we absolutely silence them. Um, you know, that's been shown now over and over again. And in fact, some lovely early work that Ray Nairn and Tim McCrenna did showed that when issues come up, and this was the Haka Party incident way back in the um, late 70s, that really upset the public, then we all blame Māori for being oversensitive. And actually that's still going on, or for being stirrers or radicals. Um, so in other words, we're still doing this limited repertoire of emotions, avoiding vulnerability and not liking to look deeply within. Um, and even in much more recent work, so the bottom reference there is Alex McConville and his colleagues. Um, and actually others of you I know who are listening in, I know um, Jessica's done work on this with remembering and um, there's another um, um, recent um, master's thesis on um, um, reconciliation by Alistair Rees. Anyway, this is, you know, a number of ma good master's theses in, in New Zealand are doing work on this. But this is um, Alex McConville saying that the familiar emotional sequences that come up his works around Anzac Day and Waitangi Day, they absolutely limit the emotional possibilities for bicultural relationships in this country. So I think we have a pretty fair grounding here for thinking we should be looking at this area and we are still being influenced by that, um, you know, the, the manly emotional colonial re regime <laughs> of avoiding those emotions. Now, to just look um, at a um, methodology that's re really interesting, going back to Gergen and his social psychology, he did some experimental work, actually, where he just set up um, a flatmate situation, flatmate sitting in the living room, another flatmate comes in and um, expresses anger. So per number one is person one, um, and number two is p um, person two. If person two then the question mark, you know, is responds to the anger with question, with why are you angry? There can be um, various options, actually. We, we aren't limited to just one set of responses. We actually do have options. So if there's the question and person one, the angry one, um, chooses to explain, but that that includes blame, then typically you'll get in person two, you know, um, anger, and then more anger in person one and so on. You get a kind of a, um, a little escalation of hostility. And sadly, in our British colonial emotional regime, um, and probably in European Western emotional regimes, that's actually quite an acceptable emotional sequence, sadly. You know, anger, um, blame, defense, hostility, and off it goes. Whereas there are other options. And so here we're looking at a couple of other ones that Gergen and his... Um, you know, his um, participants figured out is there can be an explanation about the anger and it can be even blaming. But if the um, questioning party shows remorse, you actually start a completely different trajectory of emotional sequence. Then the originally angry person can cautiously, um, you know, show some compassion maybe as to why the other person got it wrong. On the other hand, they could go back to being angry. And then the last one is that there could be an explanation of the anger, um, but no blame. And then the questioner can show empathy. And then the angry person, um, doesn't matter really if we've got our ones and twos wrong here, can, can confirm and go further. 
So you can see that we're not stuck in, our, in the emotional sequences of the top one. We do have options. But interestingly, Gergen and his people found that some emotions, like um, guilt was one, were stoppers at, and just seemed to stop an emotional sequence. That's really interesting. On the other hand, so were some positive things, like acknowledgement and confirmation were endpoints in the emotional sequence as well. So that's really hope, you know, positive, hope giving. Right. So again, let's look at um, our own sequences. If we look at our own sequence of emotions between um, kind of the, what's gone on in the Ma Māori Pākehā relationship, um, over time, and this is, you know, there's been a number of writers about this, I've written about it in my PhD, that you, and, and many of us will know, there's a lot of beautiful historical work coming on stream, I mean, Anne Salmon's books, I mean, there's many, many others, where we're actually trying to explore when the relationship was better between Māori and Pākehā, and when Māori had all their resources, um, all their authority, and Pākehā were negotiating with them respectfully, Actually, it was a very good short-term relationship in those years, from the late 1700s to the um, 1850s. Um, the treaty itself, I mean, we, there's many interpretations of both texts of the treaty, but we're even, now we've got Hugh Fletcher's son, Ned Fletcher, come out with a master's, I think it is, or PhD, where he's saying the English text of the treaty is not quite the bogey that we all thought it was either. Even the English text had good intentions. So, you know, we're busy in, you know, interpreting all this. So, it's, you know, we could say the intention of the treaty, both texts, was that there should be a good long-term relationship. And then what happened was, you know, colonisation. Pākehā had the numbers and they had that majoritarian ideology, majoritarian democracy as being the only civilised form of government, and still that colonial ideology, you know, of um, how, you know, the ladder of civilization and that modernism w was with the Western um, direction and indigenous societies were to be trained, you know, transformed. And what we got then, and we all know the story, is that, and if you look at all the actions of colonization, you see there, if you analyze them emotionally, an absolutely brutal indifference towards Māori and the fate of the Māori world. So you have to say that, you know, in the last um, century and a half, we've had a poor relationship. So that's the situation we're in now. So let's go from, yeah, and then what have we got now? We have had, I mean, Alistair Rees says, we've got an uneasy relationship now because we've got two things going on. We've got an ongoing um, trajectory of the unilateral decisions by Pākehā with the institutional racism. Thank you, Heather, for your work, showing that that has not disappeared um, in the media work. And then you get that ongoing, you know, um, emotional regime of complacency, resistance, hostility, indifference. But you've also got a whole lot of Pākehā and Tauiwi who are going in those other directions that Gurgen suggested and asking, why are you angry <laughs> to Māori? What do you want? Um, I know that sounds really simplistic, but that's the question, really. And then um, the responses that we're getting to the explanations are, you know, we have some choices of listening of shock, of discomfort, of remorse, of reparation. So, you know, some real trying to change the, um, the trust um, factors in the relationship. So now for the um, second half, we'll go into the actual um, theorizing that the treaty um, educators did, just to give you some examples, and then we'll look at the Māori theorizing. So the treaty educators were theorizing that um, the initial emotional responses that Pākehā feel when, when we hear about the poor relationship now and the brutality of colonisation is we often do have those um, responses of shock, of pain, of grief. And we'll unpick those a little bit more in a minute. We also have, which are kind of emotional responses to shifts in our worldview um, of being critically challenged um, about what we thought the history of benign colonization was, and we feel intensely uncomfortable and uneasy and remorseful. And then this is a little outlier, but it's a very interesting one if you're doing emotional um, analysis in New Zealand situations, is that some people find, some reported in my research, that their emotional empathy was awakened by being immersed in supportive Māori environments and being taken in 
you know, in under tikanga Māori into those environments where they were treated as one of the Fano, and having enough awareness to realise how grateful they felt for that and how much ease and confidence that relationship gave them. So here are now our um, participants' um, actual sayings from their evaluation forms. So this is quite recent, some of this. So this is awareness um, that is flowing through from them of um, realising that they, the critical challenges to their own beliefs about colonisation. So they realise, oh, you know, Māori weren't tricked or fooled. So that's a shift in their belief about Māori authority and Māori agency. Um, and, you know, in reflection being really critical about what they were taught. So, you know, this is very much step one in transformational learning and in changing your worldview. But, you know, the lovely density there in that, bo that bottom quote, you know, I feel as, so the instant step forward in confidence. I feel as though I can actually engage in a conversation about tetiriti and be confident about it. And that's so typical that the moment Pākehā and tauiwi, other Tauiwi learn a history of colonisation that makes the conversation with Māori mutually intelligible, at least, even if, you know, the emotional trajectories have been different, at least there it can be a conversation about what's happened and where we are now. And that that's and a huge step forward in the relationship. Um, these are examples of empathy um, growing through hearing about the history of colonisation. So people tend to put both in. They, they say what they learned as well as how they respond to it, how European law and way of living crippled the Māori unfairly. So you can kind of hear the intensity, the emotional intensity. I can understand the feelings of injustice and outrage by Māori. And that it's very sobering helping to feel the issues that arose from treaty breaches and that it's a humbling experience so you know there's all there's you know a lot of data in my work about people feel all those things you know shame um my, my own sister was in a workshop in nelson and she stood up in tears at the end of the workshop and said because i'd been talking about the positive export trade that marty had been in and those um, the shipbuilding and all that and she said that changes everything <laughs> and you know it, that's a very dense statement what she meant was if if you're telling us that Māori had agency and authority that means you know da -da 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 -da. it means we have betrayed the relationship it means you know Māori have been waiting all this time it means da -da. so she was meaning it changes everything so, you know, you can see the, um, the depth of emotion that's there, sometimes very cryptically in what people say. Um, so they're, they're doing everything at once, I think. They're um, adopting new worldviews, they're build, growing their empathy, they're feeling remorse, they're, um, you know, rethinking um, what that means for Māori today, what it means for them in the future, what it means for their identity. I think it's all going on, to be honest. Um, so people also do reflections about the relationship itself um, and the future of it. They think, good heavens, how we have dominated the other. For Māori, this was never an intended outcome of signing the treaty. So people are looking across history when they have these responses. And they're saying, the Māori perception is that the Treaty of Waitangi is about the future. I'd never considered this before. So again, people are, are reconstructing, you know, constructing afresh their idea of the future of the relationship. Now, we could pause there and ask for reflections, or would people like to move on to the Māori theorising at this stage? I think the Māori theorising is enormously Yes, important. yes. okay. Right, thank you. I'll just flick through some other ones, um, which basically say the same things there, like um, you've, we've basically covered that. Yes, this was the kind of visual material that the treaty workers gave. You kind of get the general idea there, this about emotional and intellectual journeys, um, stages of learning. Um, I'll just uh, pause here for a second. You can see in the middle there um, some Treaty educators theorised that there were cycles of emotion that Pākehā could get stuck in. 
and they are naming denial, anger, hostility, guilt, and blame as cycles to get stuck in, which was completely um, confirming Gergen's um, thoughts about that. And that they are the end points of emotional sequences. Nobody gets any further if you stop there. <laughs> okay, so now we're on to Māori theorising. So this is some beautiful work, again, um, I think a master's thesis, yes, by Arama Rata and her colleagues James Yu and Katya Hanka in um, Victoria. Um, Arama went to her own people in Taranaki, to the hapu there, um, you know, and we know what the Taranaki hapu went through in terms of both the militia um, and the British Army, um, um, you know, imposing upon them. Um, and so when she asked those Fano there, um, what is the process for you that would lead to forgiveness? And this is what their theorizing was, which is actually rather different from the Christian theorizing. Well, superficially different. They were saying that um, she picked out three themes. The first theme was the one of rongo, so which many of us know as the pa a pathway to peace. And she was saying, yes, it's a commitment to restore relationships. So a very deep um, meaning of um, the tikanga of rongo. Also, whakapapa, so um, building or finding and building and rebuilding the connections between people, places and events over time so that identity is formed that whakapapa's people in to places and events um, over time, that that's a really important theme. And the last one, a more pragmatic one in a way, is kaupapa. So what is the agenda here um, on the based on the um, outcomes of forgiveness. You know, where will, where will our joint relationship go and the benefits for our parties? Um, if we think about the Christian theorizing of forgiveness, we often do, we sometimes think of it more superficially as just, oh, well, you know, you need to forgive and forget. You know, we have these really, really quite superficial sayings. Although I have to be grateful to Ray Nan and his partner Mitzi in a recent um, discussion, Mitzi pointed out that, look, actually, the Christian idea of forgiveness is based on um, repentance. So actually, there's a huge process there as well. It's not just forgive and forget. That's our rather modernist era, um, you know, short, cliched saying. But actually, the deeper theology of forgiveness is to do with repentance and with being seen to want to restore the relationship. Um, so that whole... In the theological area, there is some beautiful work. And in fact, um, Alistair Rees's um, master's is, comes from that theology. Now I'm going to a, a psychology colleague, Erana Cooper, so the daughter of Rob Cooper. Um, she encouraged us at a recent psychology conference. Very clearly, she called her whole presentation um, the language of the heart. And she said that what Pākehā need to do, practitioners, she was meaning, but look, it goes for all of us. I mean, academics, we're practitioners. We need to learn the language of the heart um, because she's acknowledging as, you know, we're doing here that emotional responses in our local history are situated in these long histories of our relationship. We need to be informed, she says. We need to be informed about the history of the relationship. And she said, in fact, be informed over and over again. Um, you know, hear the stories over and over again um, in specific times and places. So in other words, there's not just one treaty workshop. It's then go to the local marae, then go to the hapu, then read this, then do that. It's, she was absolutely saying there's not just one um, moment of learning um, the history of the relationship. We have to learn it from everyone's point of view, you know, and then all the different tauiwi communities as well. And then she was saying quite explicitly, empathy and remorse are highly appropriate emotions, emotions in response to um, learning about the history of our Māori Tawiwi relationship. And then that's my phrase, that responsive remembering is a form of restorative practice. Um, I'm still busy theorising all this. So last couple of slides, folks. We're nearly there. Yes, and then there's other promising local work, um, both by Pākehā Māori um, and um, other tauiwi, actually. And, oh, Susan Nemick, who's there in Auckland, I think, 
is doing some beautiful work about um, Tauiwi communities who are watching Māori television. Um, and another um, a Japanese academic here from Waikato originally, he did some beautiful work about Chinese Asian immigrants finding real, um, well, a sense of peace and belonging once they'd learned about the treaty. So there's lots of local work. So some up there, um, Kaweho Hoskins, um, Betsan Martin and Maria Humphreys about increasing our ability to respond in the relationship. So response ability in relationship with Māori. Um, that's Alistair Rees, a more theological masters about reconciliation and the quest for Pākehā identity. Um, there's some other theological references there. The Sisters of Mercy have theory about right relationships, which comes right out of the Bible, actually, um, and that we should strive towards those. Um, in many professional codes, there's um, a kind of edging towards relational ethics and values rather than standards of conduct. So it's a kind of little a slow shift that's happening. And, and in fact, New Zealand professions are, well, in, yeah, in every country where they're responding to indigenous um, principles of ethics are being you know, dragged and pulled and you know, harder than in most other countries towards relational ethics, which is fantastic. And then that uh, final word there from um, those feminist sociologists and Curl, who's a peace mediator, um, that trust requires a shared moral code in the social milieu. So in other words, the work on ethics is worthwhile and equally um, the kind of working and working through treaty education and continuing to work on the Waitangi Tribunal and, you know, it's all worthwhile because it sets up what count, what is the moral code um, in our in our society, you know, I mean, I guess if that's one sub, sub message from me, it's that morality um, does matter and we are actually negotiating it all the time. <laughs> um, and we shouldn't be frightened of it, just as we shouldn't be frightened of emotional work. So look, the last slide is the um, encouragement to our, our discussion now, is saying that if meaning making depends on emotion, emotional or effective practices, as well as discursive practices, then we need to explicitly include emotions in our data gathering and our analysis. And the second point, which relates to many of your work around the country, if identities are constructed through relationships, then emotional responses in the Māori Pākehā relationship are critical data. So that's pretty much it from me. And I'm happy to go back to any earlier slides if that's helpful to people. Um, if you're getting an echo, we'll turn our um, hours off and just let Ray maybe um, facilitate a discussion. Ray, would that be the easiest? Or a bit here. We've only got We've four, only got four um, um, postcard, postcard size, size bits on the, on the green. green. So, so uh, there's a lot of people lot who aren't people visual, visible. visible. So maybe people should wave if they want to speak. Hmm? Hmm. Angry, can, can you put your PowerPoint up? Because then we can. Yes, I'm sure I can. Oh, I, I do. oh, the screen that does that is gone. Uh, it was on. You touch that, and you may get it. Oh, okay. Yes, we can. Um, I think he just hit that. Uh, camera select this desk. How about conference table? Who's that? No. Um, at, the, at the top of the zone, the zone there's a toggle to stop share. Can you see that? Okay. Don't know if we have the Zoom screen up. Is that you, Melanie? Yes. yes. <laughs> Thank you, Melanie. What we've got, Melanie, is your camera. What they can see. Shall we press that? Oh, their camera. <laughs> no, I got rid of it anyway. Yay! Oh, yes. Very good. <laughs> okay. Okay. Got okay. her. If you question, comment, just wave a hand. Sue. Um. Can we get access to those wonderful PowerPoints, please? 
Yes, but give me till Friday because I will need to put the references in. <laughs> so yes, um, where do we post those, Ray or Melanie? Yeah, do you... If you send them to me, I can get them put up on. Me, I can put up on. Kia ora, Melanie. Yes. Is it okay to put them up on the web, or would you rather they just went to, to individual? Absolutely fine to have them on the web. Okay. okay. Surely that's not the only comment, suggestion, <laughs> query. Um, okay, can I go again? Um, thank you so much, Ingrid. That is just amazing, 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 and it kind of looks at ways that will inform my work and my teaching from here on in. Um, I used to think trying to teach about structural racism as opposed to individual racism, that the way to, if, if, if you wanted, my, if I wanted my students to actually feel it, then I went to individual cases and then they could identify with that individual case and yes, they would feel empathy. But if I talked about structural racism, the empathy went. Um, and I, yeah, where am I going from here? There's a tension there, it seems to me, that what you said today will make me think about how I proceed from here. Does that make any sense? In the body, it, body. <laughs> it does, um, Sue, because those participants, for instance, they were reacting to, you know, your standard treaty workshop about structural racism. Mm -hmm. um, no, no individual stories in there, actually. Wow. Um, wow. And, yeah. and yet yeah. people um, start to think about the relationship over time. So mm -hmm. I, I think it is just about um, bringing their whole relationship alive. Yeah, and, yeah, and seeing it more as a relationship. I mean, all of us want our relationships to be good and honourable, <laughs> and so when people start to hear bad news about betrayal in relationships, it starts to touch them. Yeah. Heather, does that make sense for you? Um, I'm not a psychologist, Ray. No, I didn't expect you to be. <laughs> I don't often think about this element of the game, because I think that if I, if I spend a lot of time in that space, it would make it harder to get on with what I do. So mm -hmm. I'm interested to hear what you have to say, but as someone who's on a mission around institutional racism, my focus is on the outcomes and pragmatic ways of doing it where you don't have to win the hearts and minds of everybody. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Which isn't to say that the work that others are doing, winning their hearts and minds, isn't incredibly valuable, and not that sometimes we don't get involved in that, but, but it's not a core business, which is obviously quite provocative. Um, Jessica? Um, yeah, maybe just adding to this, have I agree, because I think especially in this kind of neoliberal climate of individualism and you know reverse racism and having white people as the victims, often in these discourses it's especially hard to win the hearts and minds I think, of people and also i guess my question is how to overcome still that resistance that you talked about ingrid um to well changing your mind i guess or to taking things on board so i think that literature around emotions or resistance to change uh reminded me i mean there's some work of course by stan cohen the states of denial um, Charles Mills in his racial contract, he has a chapter on the ignorance contract. So, uh -huh. and I think it's quite useful to set it in that wider context of imperialism, racism globally, I guess. So uh, that literature, well, apart from Stan Cohen, but comes out of the whiteness literature. There's also Melissa Stein in South Africa who writes about ignorance in post-apartheid reconciliation work. Um, all sort of as an expression of Pakeha trying to protect their privilege at a time when it's under threat. Mm. More comment than a question. I oh, yeah, I, I agree with you, Jessica. And something else you said earlier, Ingrid, about uh, remembering and Paul Conton's work on remembering and also on the deliberate act of forgetting. And I think you mentioned Anzac and, and other sort of events that we 
ensure that we focus on to remember, um, which almost excuses us from, or lets, uh, allows us to forget other events. And we sort of re put all our energies into something like ANZAC and make that who we are instead of something like the Treaty of Waitangi and Waitangi Day. And it's like a deliberate act of remembering the ANZAC so that we can forget or excuse ourselves from forgetting other particular events. I think both those things are really powerful um, I don't know, actions or things that people get involved in, put their energies into. Yeah. I was just, um, I don't know whether anyone else was there, but I'm actually just back from the Peace Hikoi in, in Taranaki. And one of the interesting things about that is, was the great conversations we had on the way. And um, it was interesting because some of the people's heads and hearts were there. Well, hearts were there, but their heads weren't necessarily there in terms of the, the understanding you would hope. And so, yeah, just a, um, it's a bit risky sometimes when the hearts get there before the heads get there sometimes. Because <laughs> yeah. it's been interesting to watch watching social media around, around, around that. Around that. And, and how right, right some of the people that people that are commenting in that many space about about different issues and it's not it's not respectful. Mm -hmm. But there is a there is an amazing way to Ingrid, do you want to write a reply or? or yeah, uh, no, well it's a an affirmation really to all that's been said by um Jessica, Heather, um, others, um, is, oh yes, I mean the, you know, the, you know, constructed ignorance and so on grinds on, the resistance, the denial grinds on. What this is probably saying is encouraging any of us in any situation more for people, for, the, for there to be room for the emotional responses, mm -hmm. um, that people, they're, they're shifting their heads around, but they're shifting their hearts around as well. So, um, and I'm actually, but with all of you, I'm a little bit suspicious of only appealing to people's hearts because like mm -hmm. Heather, um, yep. the, we, and we know this, we know this from the whole history of anti-racism work. In fact, you get, you know, very uninformed um, bleeding hearts. <laughs> and so, and the tr treaty educators, to give them credit, never theorized that the heart was leading. They said, people differ. Some people start with their hearts and then they start learning more. Other people start with their heads and then they have an emotional response. True. So people kind of go and, you know, in a um, shifting way like that. But the, the two do need to continue on in tandem. But I think, I mean, I know Neville, for instance, I know in other courses, you must all have tried different ways of letting students respond with their hearts and find finding an accessible way of doing that, <laughs> um, you know, by them writing logs or um, process reflections and so on. But I, I guess it's encouragement too that that's really important to let people um, explore their feeling responses, both their resistance and their empathy responses a, as they learn more. So, um, yeah, so it's affirmation of everything that you've all said and saying, no, definitely the heart probably shouldn't be leading. The two should go in tandem. Mm -hmm. But one of the oh, things that I'll take yeah. away from this is that there are a range of emotional responses yeah. uh, available. Yeah. Yeah. And simply putting that in front, in my case, putting that in front of students is incredibly uh, useful. Mm -hmm. So they might have the notion, well, actually, I hear I'm feeling incredibly um, sorry and immobilized, but there may be ways in, in teaching and classing to say, well, you know, what we observe is that there are a range of emotional, and I don't believe that we are prisoners to our emotions. We can, uh, we can choose our, our emotional response. And, and even just laying out that landscape of varied emotional responses uh, could be really yeah. useful. I'll just add to that. I'm just encouraged by Neville, because I do think that, remember that top sequence of Gergens, which was, you know, the classic Western one, which is you meet anger, um, and blame with hostility and more anger and defensiveness and resistance. And I, I think we can help people understand that it's um, they don't have to translate remorse or shame 
into instant resistance mm -hmm. that you can go other places with remorse or yeah. um, shame or empathy yeah so it's just yeah helping us open up the um the path the emotional pathways that we don't just go lockstep back into resistance because we don't un we we're not accustomed to feeling embarrassed or sh ashamed or remorseful <laughs> Thank you, Ingrid. Thank you, Ingrid. And thank you and thank for you all, all participants. participants. Um, um, I just want I just to want finish, to finish by, saying by saying Erina's, Erina's father, father Erina, Erina Cooper, Cooper, who, who in, in, you mentioned, you mentioned Ingrid, Ingrid, her father, her father Rob, Rob has, has just died. died. Oh. Uh, that was uh, the that phone was call that I was dealing with when we were meant to be starting. Sorry to, Sorry to end on that end note, on that, but uh, I think it's I something, think we, something should we should share, yeah, given, given that he's that part, he's of, part the, of the um, uh, tradition in which we're, we're walking. walking. Yeah. Thank you. Kia ora, Ray. Well, well. and, yeah, and Ray, shall we make the final thing then a mihi to, to Robert? Um, I kia koe, Robert. Um, oku mihi kia koe, oku te pauri o te ngākau kia koe. A moi mai, moi mai, moi mai ra. Kia ora. Kia ora. Kia ora. Kia ora. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you.